So last lecture where we left off, I basically gave you an overview of, oh, there's a question, are the slides downloadable? Yeah, they should be. So if you open up the slides on the link on Canvas, uh, it should take you to Google Slides and then you should be able to download them from there. If you go to like file and then download. Cool, okay. So yeah, where we last left off, I kind of gave you a brief overview of a bunch of different problems that exist in the world of biobioinformatics. Um, but I didn't go super in depth on any of those. So today we're going to now go more in depth on kind of the first step of that. So today's focus is sequencing the first viral genome. Uh, so last week I told you that I think in like December or something like that, we had the genome sequence of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, but how did those researchers even create that genome sequence? Uh, so we're going to talk about some DNA sequencing technologies. We're going to talk about a computational problem known as genome assembly. And then I'm going to define these things called contigs and scaffolds that are related to genome assembly. And we'll talk about like assessing the genome sequence quality that we assemble. So a lot of these are just kind of words that you don't necessarily know yet, but we're going to dive deeper right now. So first, DNA sequencing. How does DNA sequencing even work? Um, as an analogy, I'm going to start with what I call the newspaper problem. So imagine that I have a stack of a bunch of New York Times newspapers from June 27, 2000, and I have a bunch of copies of the exact same newspaper. Uh, now imagine that I put some dynamite under my newspapers. Uh, this is just hypothetical, so obviously don't try this at home. But imagine I light the fuse, and then poof, all the newspapers explode. And all that I'm left with are these tiny charred fragments of newspaper. And the question that I have is, can I somehow use these tiny fragments of newspaper to piece together what the original newspaper said? And you might kind of intuitively think, well, I have a bunch of copies of the same newspaper. They probably didn't blow up in the exact same pattern. So what I should try to do is find pad like little pieces of blown up newspaper that have overlaps. And let me try to use those overlaps to reconstruct the newspaper. I can kind of line them up and then overlay them and kind of piece by piece reconstruct the, the newspaper. So how does this relate to genome sequencing? Well, the genome is some like in general, DNA sequences are not things that we can just read from start to finish. So a human genome, or like in the case of viruses, it's RNA genomes, it's not actually DNA, but we, we can't just read them from start to end like you would read a book. Uh, sequencing technologies for biochemical reasons that you don't have to worry about for the purpose of this class, but basically what they're able to do is kind of fragment the DNA into small pieces and then sequence these tiny chunks of DNA. So what we actually have is just kind of small fragments that we're trying to reconstruct. So you can imagine that the stack of identical newspapers in the genome sequencing world, we have a bunch of copies of the same exact viral genome. So we extract a sample of this virus. We do this replication process to get a bunch of hopefully identical copies of that single genome. And then the sequencing technology basically chops up the DNA in a bunch of random pieces. And we're hoping that it's not the exact same places that are getting chopped across those genomes that we have. We're hoping that it's pretty random. And then what we're left with are these tiny fragments that our genome sequencing machine can actually piece together. But in reality, just like with the newspaper example, how like some of the fragments probably just got blown to bits that we can't even see anymore, the sequencing machines aren't able to actually read every single little molecule that's in this sample that we have. What they do is they just kind of randomly grab some number of fragments and they read out those small number of fragments. So basically the problem that we have here is we have a bunch of copies of the original viral genome that we're trying to piece together, but we're not even able to look at the entire sequences. We're only able to see small fragments and even worse, we're only able to see a small portion of the fragments. So our question is how do we reconstruct the viral genome using these small overlapping fragments? Is the computational problem clear? Like, does everyone understand like what is the biological question and kind of what is the general bioinformatics question that we're approaching here? Any questions? Uh, feel free to unmute. Uh, so there's a question, why are there small fragments to begin with? 
So basically these sequencing machines that we have are not able to just read an entire um, kind of piece of DNA from start to end. Because of technical limitations of the sequencing machines, they're only able to read small fragments accurately. Um, sequencing technologies are constantly evolving. Does that kind of answer your question? Any other questions before I explore how we can try to solve the problem? Uh, sorry, it cut off when you said sequencing technologies are constantly evolving. We didn't hear whatever was after that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think my internet's being a little finicky. Whoops. Okay. So, um, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, so basically, yeah. So, so sequencing technologies for technical limitations that just exist, they're only able to read these small fragments. And yeah, they're evolving constantly. So we're getting closer and closer to being able to reconstruct these longer and longer fragments. But still, we can't really read out the entire genome of a virus very accurately kind of in one go. We can only accurately sequence these short fragments just because of technical limitations. Um, and if you're like a bio major, like bioengineering major or something like that, you might actually learn about how those machines work. Uh, and oh, so what are they called? So those are called uh, DNA sequencing machines. So I can actually maybe pull up a picture. Uh, Illumina Nova Seek. Um, okay, let's see. So here, so Illumina is a company that is just down the street from UCSD, or like down a couple streets. It's like off of Nobel, and they're like the leading sequencing machine manufacturing company in the world. So what's cool about being at UCSD is that if any of these things interest you. We're actually like in the hot spot, like in the whole world where we have access to the nicest stuff. Um, so these are what these machines look like. They're kind of like, I think as tall as you, maybe like maybe a little bit shorter than a person. Uh, and it's just like massive machines that are like, and you like basically put the sample in, I think here or something like that. I did, um, actually, I was one of the beta testers for this thing and they had like, they had me kind of try to run through it and ask me questions and I didn't know how to do it at all. So it was pretty embarrassing, but I guess I was a good dummy tester. But I think you like put it here and then it has a little control panel and then, I don't know, it's pretty cool. Um, so there's a question in the chat, will the fragments that the machines can read, are they located in certain places of genes or just randomly? That's a great question. So with the DNA sequencing technologies, just out of the box, um, basically they just randomly get fragments from all over the genome without knowing where they are. Uh, with COVID-19 and in general, if you know in advance what parts of the genome you're looking for, so if you already know in advance how the genome looks like and what parts you're looking for, um, you can actually design what are called primers that can target specifically those regions of interest. Um, so for example, with like a lot of human like genetic counseling stuff, if we know exactly which genes might predispose you to like cancer or to other types of bad conditions, instead of randomly like blindly sequencing the entire person, we can just design what are called primers that target just those specific parts that we think are informative. Um, so actually next week, we're going to talk about how this is used in, um, I think it's next week. I'm pretty sure either next week or the following week, we're going to talk about how we can do targeted sequencing for COVID-19. Uh, but for today, we're just assuming we're the first researchers and we have no idea what this genome looks like. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, great questions. Any other questions before I move on to the, the next part? Kind of makes sense. Oh, so there's a question. Are those primers related to CRISPR? So CRISPR is another technology. So for people that might not know, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is this really cool new technology that we can basically design little fragments of DNA that can kind of target a part of an actual living cell and like cut the genome at a very specific part. Um, so the primers that I'm talking about for sequencing are very similar to the primers that are used in CRISPR. Primer is just a fragment of DNA that I write myself, like I create this artificial fragment of DNA that matches something in the genome I'm looking at whether I'm trying to design primers for sequencing or I'm designing primers for CRISPR or I'm designing primers for like DNA fingerprinting, 
primer is just a small fragment of artificial DNA that I construct to look like a specific sequence that I'm looking at. Does that kind of make sense? Cool. Yeah, no, yeah, great questions. Awesome. Okay. So where we're at, we have all these tiny overlapping fragments, and we want to try to reconstruct them into the original viral genome. So this computational problem, this is a bioinformatics problem known as genome assembly. We're trying to reassemble the genome. So just to kind of quickly summarize, we have a bunch of copies of the same genome, and we basically shatter it into these tiny random fragments. And then the machine that we have is able to sequence these short fragments, which we call reads, because it's a short fragment that's read. So we call these reads. And then our question is, using these short reads, how do we actually reconstruct the original genome sequence by using these overlaps? OK, so there's an approach called the De Bruyne graph approach. So basically, imagine that these are the reads that I have. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, let's imagine that these are all of the, like, let's say I've somehow collected every single three-letter fragment of this genome. So remember, in reality, I've lost some of the possible fragments. But let's just, for the sake of simplicity, pretend that I have every single three-letter fragment of this genome. Um, and, and let's imagine I don't know what order they're in, right? I'm just randomly reading these sequences out. They're just some arbitrary order. Um, I wrote them alphabetically, but they have, like, this order doesn't mean anything. So how can I reconstruct the genome? Basically, this approach called the De Bruyne graph approach, we create this network that's called a De Bruyne graph, where basically you create one node for every unique prefix and suffix of the reads. And then for each of these reads, you place an edge, like a directed link, from the prefix node to the suffix node. So what does that look like? I just said a bunch of really weird sounding words. What does this look like? So basically, I look at the first read. I see the prefix. So the, the first n minus 1 letters is AC. And I see that the suffix, so the last n minus 1 letters, is CA. So I create two nodes, AC and CA. And then the read is ACA. So I draw a link from AC to CA. OK, so is everyone comfortable with the first read? Any questions of how I came up with this structure from that first read? Makes sense? OK, cool. OK, so now the next read, the prefix is AT. So I make a new node for AT. The suffix is TT. So I make a new node for TT. And then the read as a whole is ATT, which is a link from AT to TT. OK, the next read, GA to AT. So GA is the prefix. I make a new node for GA. Uh, so there's a question, are reads typically this short? No, so actually, reads are usually 100 letters long. Um, but the example would be a lot more complicated if I had 100 letters. Uh, so usually, they're 100 to 150. Yeah, great question. So now, so GA, and then the next tap is AT, or not the next tap, the suffix is AT, which already exists. So I don't make a new node. I just use the existing AT node that I already had from before, from over here. And then the read is GAT. So I create a link from GA to AT. Uh, there's a question, are the prefix and suffix always two letters? If your reads are K letters long, the prefix and suffix are always k minus one letter. So you're looking at every, so the prefix is everything except for the last letter. The suffix is everything except for the first letter. That kind of makes sense. Cool. Okay. So next read is TAC. So TA is brand new. So I make a new node for it. AC already exists over here. So I don't make a new node. And then the read is TAC. So that's a link from TA to AC. And the last one is TTA. So TT already exists. TA already exists. So now TTA is a link from TT to TA. OK, and this network structure, this is called a De Bruyne graph, this name. OK, so how do I actually use this De Bruyne graph to reconstruct the genome sequence? Maybe I'll, I'll wait a couple seconds. I don't know if anyone has any ideas 
Does anyone see any patterns here that might be helpful? Oh, so there's a question, how are these all interconnected? Basically, every time I looked at a read, I created a link from the prefix. So all of the letters except for the last letter, and then the suffix, so all the letters except for the first letter, I follow, I created an arrow from the prefix to the suffix. That's how I made these links. So there's a question, can we follow, or I guess an idea. So the idea that someone posed is, can we follow the arrows to form the sequence? Uh, oh, there's a question, how does AC, so, so it's not AC to TA, it's TA, to AC, because the, the arrows have directionality here. So this is in this direction. So it's from this read here. This was a link from TA to AC. Yeah, exactly. So the, so the idea that someone put in the chat, can we just follow the arrows uh, to reconstruct the sequence? Where do you think we should start? So the idea was, can I just start somewhere and then kind of like follow these arrows to reconstruct the sequence? What seems like a reasonable starting point? So a lot of people are saying GA, how come? What, what stands out about GA? It's only a prefix. Yeah, so GA is the only letter or it's the only node here that we don't have anything going into it. Right, so it's the only node out of all my nodes that doesn't have anything going into it. So intuitively, this seems like a good place to start. Okay, so how do we reconstruct it then? Well, the first read, so I'm gonna start at that starting node and I'm gonna visit every, I'm gonna like cross each edge, each of these links and kind of use that link to kind of append one by one to the genome. So the first edge that I'm following is GAT. So that's the first three letters of my genome. And then where do I go next? What's the next link that I should follow? Exactly, ATT. So ATT is the only link coming out of the current node that I'm at. So I'm going to follow ATT. But remember, the, the prefix of this is the same as the suffix of this, right? Because I'm guaranteed that I have every single three letter chunk of my original genome. So all I'm gonna add is just, so, so I added the entirety of this read, but I'm only gonna add the last letter of this read because the first two are already in my genome. They're these two letters. So I'm just going to, so the first read, I add the whole thing and every subsequent one, I just add the last letter. So I add T, just the T here. Okay. And then what about the next one? Where do I go next? So I'm over here now. So the next one is TTA, exactly. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Why does AT connect with TT? Because of this note here, uh, this read. This read, ATT, forced me to draw a link from AT to TT. Uh, so there's a question, can I explain again why I only add the last letter? Uh, so in my original genome sequence, I had every single possible three-letter fragment. So they overlap like the, the suffix of the previous read in my genome overlaps with the prefix of the next three letter fragment of my genome. So like this G-A-T-T, -T, this was two reads, G-A-T and A-T-T. -T. So just like in the newspaper problem where I was looking for overlaps between the newspaper fragments, what I'm basically doing here is coming up with an automated way of detecting the overlaps between the reads. So yeah, great question. Yeah, so so the GAT read and the ATT read, these two reads, the suffix of this overlaps with the so the suffix of GAT overlaps with the prefix of ATT. So I don't want to double count those. Yeah, great question. Okay, then I follow TTA, then I follow TAC, then I follow ACA, and now there's no more 
edges that I can go out of. So I'm done. And that's my genome sequence. So now I've reconstructed my genome sequence. If you haven't seen this movie, Gattaca is actually a movie. It's a really good movie uh, with Jude Law. I highly recommend. Uh, so there's a question, is there a way to create a program that will detect the prefixes and suffixes for us? That is an excellent question that segues to my next slide. So yeah, fortunately, we as the user don't have to worry about implementing this from scratch. Um, tools already exist with kind of the most popular tool being SPADES. Uh, SPADES, this stands for St. Petersburg Assembler. I don't know what the DES is for, I think it's just to make it sound cool. Um, but yeah, so SPADES is a program that implements this structure. So you basically give it raw sequence data and it tries to do this type of reconstruction, this genome assembly. Uh, there's a bunch of other genome assemblers. So if you're curious about learning more about them, uh, feel free to let me know and I can send you a link. Um, I also have a link to the software page in the slide. So if you wanna look at the source code, all of this is open source. Uh, which uh, there's a question, what about the TA that repeats? Let me go back. Um, so TA shows up here and here, but we kind of handled not counting it twice by like when we visited TAC, we only added the last letter. So we're not like, we're not accidentally doing duplicate counting. Like we only do the entirety of the first read, but then every subsequent read that we traverse we only add the last letter so that we avoid this double counting issue. Yeah, great question. Uh, so the question in the chat, would this still work if you had reads of varying length? That's an excellent question. So, so yeah, I, I kind of oversimplified the problem by saying every read was exactly the same length. In practice, some reads might be longer, some reads might be shorter just because of limitations in the technology. Uh, and in practice, actually, remember I mentioned that um, we, we don't actually observe every single fragment. So in practice, what assemblers do, uh, in, including spades, is they, they try to see what is the length of the reads that you're providing me. And let me pick some smaller length that I'll break up your reads into smaller fragments than even your read length. So here, like, for example, maybe it'll break them up into length. I don't know, like in this simple example, maybe like you'll take these reads that are length, what is this, eight? This one, oh, this is nine. I think they're different lengths though. But maybe I would take these reads of these length nine or 10 or whatever and break them up into smaller kind of imaginary reads of length three, for example. So spades does this. this is, so these smaller fragments, we call them camers. K being the length. So like short fragments of length three, we would call three mers. Uh, so I'll just type that in the chat, three mers versus generally we say K mers where K is the length of the smaller length that we're breaking it up even further into. So the sequencing machine gave us these fragments, but we're kind of artificially chopping it up into even smaller chunks to hopefully have this like perfect overlapping situation. So in practice, spades usually uses, uh, I think like a couple different lengths. It tries like K equals 20. So like break down your hundred length reads into small 20 length chunks. I think it tries like 25 and then maybe like 30 or something like that. So there's a question, does spades reassemble and uh, reassemble the sequence and then the sequence machine read? So, so the sequencing machine reads these small fragments and then spades pieces them together into a single genome sequence. So spades does all of this stuff. So spades, here, let me let me go back. So the sequencing machine gives you this, and then spades builds this network, the De Bruyne graph, and then it uses the De Bruyne graph to then do this exploration algorithm and reconstruct the genome sequence. Cool. Uh, so the question in the chat, does that require, oh, so kind of back to my Kamer, like spades breaking them down into fragments of length 20, does that require the shortest read length to be K equals 20? 
Yeah, so you would have to break them down into some length smaller than the shortest read length. Um, but usually your reads are at least like 100 ish. Um, so 20 should be a pretty safe bet. Like if you have a read that's shorter than 20, you can probably just throw it out because that's probably like something messed up. Yeah, great question. Um, and if you're interested in actually using spades to analyze real COVID-19 data, um, I'll, I'll share a link to this online course that we've created uh, where you can actually do this exact experiment. Well, we give you the raw data set from the first COVID-19 sequence data, and you actually will run spades and reconstruct the genome sequence. Um, so I'll put a link to that in the chat at the end of the lecture. Cool. Any, any other questions before I move on? So I kind of introduced how sequencing machines work. And then we talked about spades, which is a tool that uses this De Bruyne graph assembly algorithm uh, to try to reconstruct the genome sequence. Any, any questions before I move on? Feel free to like, unmute, feel free to, oh, raise, uh, yeah, uh, Kathleen, go for it. Oh yeah, uh, it just, I personally think the choose of the, these cameras is a bit arbitrary. And also since the uh, DNA fragments that we can read is from random location, uh, why would that like uh, to, through this method, we can still construct a, a genome? Because I think the result can, uh, are large likely to vary from each test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that, that's a great question. So, so the first question of like, isn't the choice of K kind of arbitrary? Absolutely. Yeah, so spades, what it, so in general, the smaller the K that you choose, the less tangled this network is gonna be. But then the larger the K that you choose, the less likely it is that it's gonna be fully connected. Um, and I think I can send you the paper if you want. There's a paper that goes with spades that shows some diagrams of those trade-offs. Um, but yeah, it's completely arbitrary. They just arbitrarily pick a few different values and then see how does the network look like. And they try to use information from running that same algorithm on k equals 20, k equals 30. Just they try a couple of different things to see if they can reconstruct it. And then your second question of, if we're just randomly picking these fragments, how do we guarantee that we're actually gonna be able to reconstruct the whole genome? That's a great question that segues nicely into the next section. Uh, we're basically, I think the intuition that you're having is like, uh, let me let me see where's my annotations the the intuition that you're having here is imagine that this long green line is the actual genome and imagine that these short little red lines are the fragments that we're able to sequence and you know like what if i just happen to not have any fragments that cover this region so in practice if we know in advance roughly how long we expect the genome to be which we could do using just very simple biochemical techniques. We know how much a DNA molecule weighs, and we know like kind of the molecular composition of a DNA sequence. So we can go from a weight of the molecules to an estimated length. It's not going to be exact. It's going to be definitely a bit off, but at least like 1,000 versus 10,000 versus 100,000, we can get a general estimate. So what we usually do is actually sequence many more times that depth, they're still random. They're, they're completely random fragments. But if we know in advance, so for example, COVID-19, the genome is 30,000 letters long. What we could do is sequence like, so they, they call this like something X coverage. So, so for COVID-19, we would say like 100 X coverage would be the COVID-19 genome is 30,000, let me put a comma. Uh, and then if I do 100x sequencing, so, so it's basically like 100 times 30,000, uh, I would sequence uh, 30,000 and then two extra zeros, right? 3 million letters total. If my sequencing machine makes fragments that are 100 length long, I would try to sequence roughly 30,000 reads. If I wanted 500x coverage, I would try to get 15 million uh, letters sequenced, which if each read has 100 letters, I would do, what, 150,000 or something? I might be my math right, I think. Yeah, um, so, so excellent question. We would just sequence really, really deeply. And even then, we're still not guaranteed 
to have enough reads that cover every single part of the genome, they can actually use combinatorics and like probability theory to see uh, what is the minimum coverage that I need to be X percent, like some, some percent sure that I have covered the whole genome. So you can actually see like, what is the probability of missing some length of the genome given this many reads and then use that type of probability theory to come up with what coverage uh, would be appropriate for your research experiment. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, excellent question. Yeah, so all of this, the bio people would do before they do the sequencing experiment, just to design how much material do we need? Uh, if, if this is the length of the genome that we expect, roughly how deeply do we have to sequence? How many reads do we have to reconstruct uh, to be able to hopefully cover the entire genome with some confidence? Yeah, great questions. But as you suggested, nothing's guaranteed, right? This is completely a random process. So it very well could be that the De Bruyne graph that we reconstructed, that kind of nodes with edges structure, it could be separate. It might have multiple separate pieces that aren't connected to each other. So for example, if I happen to, uh, like let's say, um, let me see, where's my feet? So let's imagine that like this is the length of the genome. And let's imagine that I was able to sequence stuff that covered all this region and then sequence stuff that covered all this region, but just, I got super, super unlucky and there were no reads that covered this region. My gene, uh, the genome assembly tool, it can use that De Bruyne graph approach to basically do genome assembly starting at some node here and reconstruct this fragment. And it can do genome assembly here and try to reconstruct this fragment. So what the genome assembler actually gives us is not necessarily the entire complete genome. It's what we call <clears throat> contigs. Contig is short for contiguous. It's a contiguous length of assembled genome. So this is precisely because of the issue that Kathleen mentioned where there might be portions of the genome that we failed to sequence for whatever reason. So the assembler gives us its best guess. It says, well, hey, I was able to reconstruct this length of sequence and I was able to reconstruct this fragment of sequence and I was able to reconstruct this fragment of sequence, but that was all I could do. I was able to reconstruct these three fragments. Um, with sequencing technologies, there's this cool feature called paired end sequencing where we can actually do, so let me actually write the name of that on the slide, uh, paired end sequencing. We're basically, so I mentioned that the sequencing machines generate these reads that are roughly length 100. And that's just because of limitations in the sequencing machine. But the sequencing machine developers got pretty clever. And what they can do is create these longer fragments. Oops, I want a different color. They can create these like longer fragments of maybe length, um, like, like let's say that this length is roughly, maybe like a thousand letters long. So they can biologically create these like thousand letter long fragments and the sequencing machine itself can only read hundred fragment chunks. But what the machine can do is try to read this beginning hundred chunks and this end hundred chunks. So what we're getting is not only two reads, so we're getting 200 letter sequences, but also because of how we've designed the biological experiment, we don't know exactly what is between those two, but we do know that in this case, if these are both like length 100, so this is 100, this is 100, uh, roughly. And we know that roughly the fragment should be around a thousand letters. We know that between them should be roughly 980 letters long. And we know that this fragment, like this read, came before this other read on the fragment. So we know order and we know a rough idea of the gap between them. So this is called paired end sequencing. We're actually sequencing read pairs, right? So not just individual reads, but we're actually sequencing pairs of reads. So read pairs that are on the ends of a single biological molecule. Does that kind of make sense? So if we do paired end sequencing, where we actually have information about um, the order of these reads, 
and we have information about the rough distance between them, we can take these contigs that our genome assembler was able to structure. And like, let's imagine that this piece that I just drew here, maybe the first read was here and the second read was like here. We can use this information to know like, oh, well, this distance is roughly a thousand between these two reads. And then maybe there's like one read pair here and here that maybe this distance is also roughly like a thousand. And maybe we can somehow piece together that the end of this contig to the beginning of this contig, we know that it's roughly 500 letters between them. I don't know what those letters are, but at least I know roughly the length of it. And then also we know the order of the contigs. So we know that contig one came first in that original molecule, then came contig two, then came contig three. And these are the rough distances between them, uh, which kind of helps as well. So we call this kind of ordered rearrangement of contigs a scaffold. We've basically scaffolded these contigs together using the information from these read pairs. Does that kind of make sense? It's getting a little abstract now, but is everyone still kind of following? Make sense? OK. And again, this is all super complicated, but fortunately for us, we don't have to do this. We just throw our raw data at Spades, and Spades has really complex algorithms for doing this. Um, if you're ever interested in learning about these algorithms that are actually going on behind the tool, there's a great class, CSE 181, that actually the original creator of Spades, Pavel Pevsner, he's a professor at UCSD. Uh, he teaches you like this algorithm and a bunch of other algorithms behind common bioinformatics programs. Uh, so it's a really cool class. Or if you just want to learn how to use the tools, maybe you're more interested in the biology and don't really care about the computer science. Um, I'm going to post a link at the end of lecture to an online course that I've created where you don't learn the algorithms behind the tools, but you just use the tools uh, to to reconstruct kind of like to yeah just basically run the biology experiments using the tools cool yeah great questions everyone um okay so i'm going to move to the next section any questions about the previous section before i move on to the last part nah take another sip of my tea What are the key? So that's a great question. There's a question in the chat. What are the key differences between contigs and scaffolds? So the contigs are just these individual assembled fragments of DNA. The scaffold is an ordering of the contigs. So it's all the information that you have about the contigs, but also additional information about which one came first, which one came second, which one came third, yada, yada. So the scaffold is the same information as the contigs plus order information. Does that kind of make sense? Cool. Okay, so let's say that we did a sequencing experiment, we ran it through spades, and out comes a genome assembly, and I want to know how good is it, right? So this is what spades gives us. Spades gives us these contigs that I've just arbitrarily ordered uh, in decreasing order of length. How do I actually measure how good of an assembly that is? Um, so, so if you think about it as far, like, so if we didn't know any information about the genomes themselves, uh, what would you prefer the assembly to look like? Would you prefer for it to be long, like few long fragments, or would you prefer it to be for it to be many short fragments? What do you think would be a better genome assembly? Just kind of conceptually thinking, um, would a good outcome be fewer long fragments or would it be more short fragments fewer long ones yeah longer more accuracy right because if you think about it in the most extreme if we were able to actually like reconstruct the whole genome we would have one super long fragment so if you think about it we want fewer longer fragments so if i order them in order of length i want kind of some really long fragments. And there's a metric called N50, which basically imagine that I define total contig length. So this is assuming I don't know the true length of the genome. Let me just add up the lengths of my individual contigs. So this is some length, this is some length, this is some length, this one's some length, this one's some length. 
Let me add up the lengths of all my contigs and call that total contig length. The N50 metric, which is an accuracy metric for, or a quality metric for genome assemblies, it's the largest contig length, so the maximal contig length, such that the total contig length of all contigs at least as big as this length is at least 50% of the genome. So that sounds really confusing, uh, but if I work through an example, I think it'll make more sense. So here I've just drawn some lengths on these contigs. And yeah, so, so N50 is the maximal contig length such that the total length, so the total length of all contigs at least as big as this contig is at least 50% of the genome's length. Uh, sorry, 50% uh, of the total length of all the contigs. So here, the total length of all the contigs is 150, right? So 150 is the total length of all the contigs. 50% of that, right? 50% of the total length of all the contigs is 95. So what I'm looking for is the longest contig length such that the length of that contig plus all the lengths of the bigger ones is at least 95. So let's try this out. Let, let me look at just the first contig. So total contig length of 70 is just 70 because there's only one contig with greater than or equal to that length, which is itself. 70 is less than 95. I failed. I'm not done yet. I need it to be at least 95, right? But it's still less than 95. So the first contig alone wasn't enough. Okay, let me try looking at the first two contigs. So the first two contigs, so contig, total contig length 60. So the total length of all contigs of length at least 60. So the lengths 60 and 70. So 70 plus 60, the total contig length of this one, the length 60 and everything longer than it is 130 which is greater than or equal to 95. So it is at least 50% of the total contig length. So we would say that the N50 is 60. So 60 was the length of the longest contig such that that contig plus all of the longer contigs was at least half my genome length. Uh, so there's a question in the chat, where does the 95 come from? So the 95 was, the total genome length was, sorry, the total length of all of my contigs together was 190. 95 is 50% of that. So the 95 came from 50% times the total length of all my contigs together, which is 190. Uh, there's a question. So basically, uh, it had to, it has to be greater than the average. Um, not the average. Uh, greater than half of it. Yeah, yeah, not the average, but similar concept. Okay, so let me let me go back. So, so there's a question in the chat. What would be a good N50 value? That's a good question. So, let's imagine that I ran spades, and then I was given my contigs, and now I computed the N50. What do you think would be good? A bigger number or a smaller number? Maybe like take a little bit of time to think about that. Would we want the N50 to be bigger or do we want the N50 to be smaller? Uh, so there's a question, why does contact length of 60 add 70 plus 60, whereas just contact length of 70 is 70? It's because uh, this total contact length function that I've defined is the total length of all contigs at least that length. So total contact length of 70 is the total length of all contigs at least length 70, which is just length 70, versus total contig length of 60 is the total length of all contigs at least length 60, which is 60 and 70. 70 is bigger than 60. So everything at least 60. Okay, so I'm seeing people in the chat in the chat write bigger. So people are saying a bigger N50 is better. Perfect. Again, let's think of the extreme good example. The extreme good example is I have a single contig that's the entire genome length. The N50 for that genome assembly would be the length of the entire genome.
So bigger is better here. Yeah, great insight. So I'm going to try to kind of, we're almost at the end, so I'm going to kind of rush through this. Uh, there's another metric called NG50. So hopefully N50 kind of made sense. NG50 is now, well, in N50, I didn't need to know the length, the length of the genome. All I needed to know was the length of my contigs. And I kind of used the total length of my contigs as my, my accuracy comparison. But with NG50, let's assume that somehow I do know the total genome. length. So for example, maybe I did that weighing experiment that I was able to reconstruct roughly how long the genome is. So it's the exact same thing as N50, but instead of having my comparison be against 50% of the total contig length, like instead of having it be 50% of the total length of all my contigs, it's 50% of the total genome length. So instead of comparing against 95, like I did last time, I'm comparing against the genome length times 50%, which is 135. So I'm pretty much out of time. Let me just kind of quickly go through this. Um, so remember total contact length of 60 is 60 plus 70, which is 130. That's less than 135. So I'm not done yet. I have to go one more. Total contact length 30, because that's the next biggest contig, is 30 plus 60 plus 70, right? The length of all of the contigs at least as big as 30, which is more than 135, right? That's 160. So the NG50 for this exact same assembly, because like if this is the genome length, the NG50 is 30. So in general, NG50 is a better metric to use. Um, so I see someone had to leave out. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is pretty much the last slide. Again, thankfully, we don't have to compute these ourselves. We can just use existing tools. So Quast is a tool made by the same lab that made spades where you feed it your genome assembly, that spades output, and it computes a bunch of stuff. It computes plots like this, it computes N50, NG50, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then what can you do with that genome sequence that you've assembled? You can basically use this tool called BLAST that lets you, it's basically like the Google search of uh, DNA sequences. You basically type in a query DNA sequence, in your case, your genome assembly, and then it'll try to tell you what sequences it looks most similar to. So here I tried doing a, a BLAST search of the COVID-19 genome sequence, that first one. And I restricted the search results to be everything before the COVID-19 pandemic. And you can see that we see like the highest matches are these bat SARS-like coronaviruses. So we can actually start reconstructing information about what virus do I have right now by seeing what is it most similar to. So we're going to use these insights in the upcoming weeks.